Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and thanks to the French Ministry of the Interior, we have access today to the coolest combat revolver ever made. This is a Manuron MR73, and this specifically is the GIGN sniper version of the MR73. Now I want to start by discussing the fact that GIGN used a revolver, which is pretty unusual in the special operations community. And the first question a lot of people ask is, why on earth would an organization like this pick a revolver? Well, this revolver, it, the, the requirements for it, came in the very early 1970s, and you so you have to consider it in the context of the time. The auto-loading pistols that were uh, most readily available to GIGN at that point were guns like the 1911, the Browning High Power, the Mac 50, the French Army uh, standard pistol at that time. All of those guns are single action only, uh, which means they cannot be used immediately upon being drawn. Um, they weren't being carried chambered, cocked, and locked. These guns were being carried either hammered down or with an empty chamber, and so they required some sort of manipulation before they could be ready to fire. A double action revolver, and by the way, yes, we can argue that they wouldn't necessarily have to be, but that's how they were used at the time. So a double action revolver has no manual safety, it doesn't require cocking, it doesn't require loading, nothing. Draw, pull trigger, fire. So that was one major advantage that it offered. Secondly, uh, auto-loading pistols at that time were not known to be particularly reliable with anything other than standard FMJ ball ammunition. And especially groups like GIGN had to be concerned about over-penetration. For example, airline hijackings. You don't, if, if you have to shoot someone in an airliner, it's almost impossible to have a shot that doesn't have a bystander behind your target, because it's an airliner. And so they were concerned about FMJ going through a terrorist and then hitting, say, an airline passenger. But with revolver, you can, you're perfectly acceptable to use, say, jacketed hollow points, bullets that are going to expand and not overpenetrate. That wasn't possible so much in the auto loaders at the time. And lastly, in the, the one criteria that most people recognize and often uh, comment on is reliability. Uh, Auto-loading pistols are pretty darn reliable in the 70s, but not as reliable as a revolver. Every once in a while you're going to get a failure to feed, you're going to get a failure to extract or eject. You don't get that with a six-shot revolver. So on top of those considerations, which really make a, revolve, make a revolver make quite a lot of sense, on top of that GIGN as an organization uh, had a philosophy that was more focused on a few very precise, very good shots, rather than overwhelming volume of firepower. So to their mind, a six-shot capacity really wasn't a problem, especially considering most of the other guns at the time had an eight or nine round detachable magazine, six wasn't that much fewer, and they weren't seeing any, any real need to have more than six. You know, if they can't get the job done in two or three, they're not doing it right, and they trained to do it right the first time. I should probably mention GIGN is uh, the special operations um, unit of the French Gendarmerie. They're the equivalent of like the FBI hostage rescue team. Uh, so they're the ones who are doing a lot of counterterrorism. Uh, you could equate them to GSG-9 in Germany. Um, not really SEAL teams because they're not really military, they're more police, but um, that was their operational spectrum. So as a result of all of these design criteria, uh, the Manuron company comes up with uh, a revolver design, they submit it, it gets adopted in 1973, GIGN, uh, it becomes GIGN's standard issue sidearm, and uh, gets quite a lot of very effective use. Now these are typically issued in like three, four, and five and a quarter inch barrel versions, but they also had an eight inch barrel version, and that's what we have here. This is a version that was, as you can see, equipped out with a low power pistol scope and a bipod, and this is legitimately the sniper version of the revolver. Now in order to properly understand the context of this, you need to recognize that GIGN had a tremendous amount of flexibility in its weaponry. So GIGN operators had a ton of guns at their disposal, basically anything that they wanted, and for any given mission they could pick out what they thought was the most appropriate weapon to take. So some people will see a scoped revolver like this and say like, well, 
what, did they have a problem with rifles? Like, rifles work, rifles work better than this. Well, the answer is yes they do, most of the time, but not all of the time. There are situations where a rifle is too large, too bulky, too long, too heavy to be the, the ideal weapon for a particular mission. Case in point, in 1981 GIGN took over the mission of presidential security for the President of France. Um, previously had been the domain of the police agencies, went over to the Gendarmerie. In the presidential mansion there are a number of big round windows that have very little space behind them. And if you wanted to position a sniper up there on Overwatch, uh, the problem is the rifle barrel is going to have to stick out the window. And that's a bad thing, you don't, you know, you want these guys to be covert. Well, if you have someone up there with a bipod mounted scoped revolver, they can be completely discreet, invisible, and yet still have more than enough potential accuracy to make the longest shot required inside a building. Where, you know, even one of these grand European palaces, you're not talking more than like a hundred yards potential anywhere for a shot from one of those positions. These are exceptionally accurate revolvers, put a scope on it, put a bipod on it, and it is perfectly capable of fulfilling that mission really well. So that's the sort of thing that these guns were intended for. The markings on here are uh, pretty basic and standard. We have MR73 caliber 357 Magnum, and a manual uh, name and logo on the right side with a beautiful glossy high polish blue finish. They have a swing out cylinder. That's all pretty basic, simple stuff right there. So mechanically speaking, the MR73 is kind of an improved version of Smith & Wesson lockwork. Um, this is a 357 Magnum caliber revolver. Uh, the guys at GIGN had quite an independent streak, and as one might expect, a bit of a macho streak. And they initially actually looked into using kind of custom loaded ammunition that was like plus P plus 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 plus. <laughs> Uh, but that had a deleterious effect on the longevity of the guns, and it was quite difficult to shoot. Like, a little too difficult to shoot well and accurately. So they stepped it back to standard, just 357 Magnum. Um, however, the guns were required to be able to withstand the GIGN, uh, like the general training routine. These guys shoot a lot of ammunition. Um, the number that I found, which I'm not 100% sure on, but it's certainly in the right ballpark, was this gun had to be designed to withstand 150 rounds of full power 357 Magnum per day for the entire life of the pistol, because that's the sort of round count that GI Gen operators were actually shooting for practice on a regular daily basis. So something like a Smith & Wesson, the gun was very nice, but it, it, it uh, lost cylinder gap, it lost timing, uh, it just wasn't up to that sort of multiple hundred thousand round lifespan. And that's what the MR73 was designed to meet. So there is a tremendous amount of hand fitting that was involved in these guns. They were very expensive revolvers, they still are today, uh, but the quality is there to match the price and to match that sort of longevity. Um, the trigger mechanism is built with a couple of roller bearings in it to give a very smooth trigger pull. It actually has a trigger that is adjustable in both single and double action. Uh, it has a bit of a heavier cocking uh, stroke than is typical, but it, on the other side of the equation, it has a, a bit of a lighter and smoother double action trigger pull than is typical. And man, that is nice. It really was designed to be able to be fired with a, a high level of precision in double action. Um, going back to that, being able to draw and fire immediately from the holster. So uh, now the sniper model here specifically has a Bushnell scope on it, which is not a brand we think of today as being like a super effective, like if someone was going to make the ultimate military presidential protection sniper pistol, uh, a Bushnell Magnum Phantom is probably not the scope you would think of. But this is the 1970s and this is what was available. So it's a two and a half power scope, uh, obviously has uh, elevation and windage adjustments on it. The crosshair is just a, or the reticle is just a simple crosshair. The bipod mount is a block here that is tightened in place by this. It has four uh, round rods that are used to center it around the barrel on this particular one. One of those is missing. Uh, and you'll see that the bipod, the, the mounting block is marked manual. Uh, apparently what actually happened was the, the 
uh, gendarmerie arsenal that was supporting the GIGN at the time. The armorers there designed this, they came up with exactly how they wanted it to work, how they wanted it designed. Uh, they then gave those blueprints to Manuel, and Manuel manufactured them and sold them back to GIGN. The bipod is a standard Harris bipod from the time, uh, quite good, nothing particularly exotic. And of course it folds back into the gun, you got a couple spring-loaded legs, and you can extend the legs quite a lot, uh, should uh, your position require it. Obviously this is the sort of thing that can be used in a lot of fairly awkward positions. The accuracy standard for an MR73 out of the factory was no more than a 20 millimeter group at 25 meters, that's equivalent to about 8 tenths of an inch. Uh, these are supremely accurate revolvers. Um, the, the hand fitting and the, the quality that went into them is really, it shows through. These are every bit as good of a gun as a Colt Python, arguably better um, given the, the longevity that they can stand up to. So the last question that comes up is, uh, are they still using these? Because the GIGN likes to, uh, likes to show these off. They're quite proud of this, they kind of like the, the idea that they are these high speed operators using 357 Magnum revolvers. Well, the truth of the matter is this, the MR73, not the sniper ver version here, but the standard revolver, is still the official GIGN sidearm for ceremonial purposes. And they still have them in their armories. However, they haven't really been an operational weapon since probably about 2000. Uh, but there's no way you can make a definitive statement on that, because, as I described earlier, uh, they have a tremendous amount of individual uh, latitude and discretion on weaponry for any particular mission. So it is entirely possible that some of the, the old time operatives kept carrying revolvers well past when they had really good semi-auto alternative options, simply because they liked revolvers and they were used to them. Um, there is no official date of, of a GI Gen weapon like this being officially retired or officially well, there are official adoption times, but um, never officially retired. So at this time there are still a handful of these sniper versions uh, in the arsenal, but I think it's probably been 15 years since one of them was actually used operationally. So I should touch a little bit on the history of the Menuron company in general, um, because they did a bunch of different guns. So the company was actually formed right after World War I in 1919, and they started out making uh, they actually they were, they were an equipment manufacturer. This is Manufacture des Machines de du Oran, um, upper roll. And uh, initially they started out making machinery and equipment for food preparation and for jewelry. Kind of an interesting dichotomy there. Uh, and then they started expanding. In 1922 they expanded uh, at first into making machinery for ammunition manufacture, and then they would diversify and expand further and uh, build their own ammunition plants in 1926, or 1928 and 1936. Those would eventually be nationalized by the government, they were used to produce ammo during World War II, and then the manual that we're familiar with today really began in the late 1940s after World War II, and that's when they, they went into actual firearms manufacture, and they started making licensed copies of a couple of foreign brands of firearms. Uh, specifically they made SIG rifles, and they also made Walther pistols. So the most common one you'll find is the Manuron uh, P1 pistols, which is, it's a P38, made under license. Uh, they would also make copies of the Walther PP and PPK, uh, and those those were produced through the 1950s, basically until Walther was able to restart its own manufacturing in Germany um, after Germany was kind of freed of some of the, of the post World War II restrictions. That relationship between Manuel and Walther over their licensed production once Walther was able to start its own business, that didn't end on a very friendly note, but that's a subject for an entirely different video. Uh, ultimately by 1983 uh, they split uh, Manuel split in two, and the defense sector with the what was firearms, but then also ammunition, cannons, and a lot of other larger scale stuff was split off. That was sold to uh, Giat, the Giat Group, which included Saint Etienne at that point in 1990, and then Giat shut down about 10 years later. So that's kind of the general overview of who Manuel was. And MR73 is, I think without a doubt, the finest revolver they ever made, and arguably one of the best revolvers ever made, period. So 
it's very cool to get a chance to take a look at one of these authentic GIGN sniper model uh, MR73s. There are very few of them still around today. So uh, a big thanks to the Ministry of the Interior for having that access. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video.